All right, let's just quickly pray. Father, before we get into today's message, again, we just want to thank you. We want to worship you. We want to acknowledge you. We thank you for your word, and your word is truth. And that you have to lift us as orphans. We have a Father that we can call upon. And we thank you, Father, for your word. I pray that as we discuss your word today, Holy Spirit, that you would open our hearts and that you would help us understand what your word is trying to teach us. We thank you for that today in the name of Yeshua. Amen. So this is part four of our series on the Great Tribulation. Just a brief recap over the last three parts of this series that we've been doing on the Great Tribulation. I've taught on the different tribulations and what tribulation means and I gave a concrete meaning of a squeezing and a compression. That's what, it, that's what it is. It's a squeezing and compression. We're entering into a times when there's going to be a squeezing like there never has been before. A compressing like there has never been before. I, I love that meaning. It just gives it such concreteness. Because tribulation is one of those words that means different things to different people. I taught Matthew 24. And what Yeshua taught about what to look for. What will be happening in these days, beginning with the time of sorrows, and then a great tribulation, all leading up to and including the day of Yahweh, which is the day Yeshua, our Messiah, will return. It will be a day of mourning for many, but also a day of rejoicing for many, depending on how you stand before God. And we also discussed about, do you have the blood of redemption over your doorpost? The night of Passover is a pattern of who is passed over and who is not. There was a great mourning throughout Egypt. Throughout the land of Egypt on that night, as they didn't have the blood of the Passover lamb on their doorpost. So there will also be a great mourning on the day of the return of the Messiah for those that don't have the, the blood of Messiah over their doorpost. I also taught on key things Yeshua said about not being deceived, not to be troubled or afraid when these times come. He has told us beforehand what must, and that's the key, it must come to pass. If we want the Messiah to return, these things have to happen. There's no way around it. There's no detour. There's no little side alley. These things have to happen before he returns. We also know how he will return. He taught us not to run after those who claim that he's here or he's there in the wilderness or in the inner rooms. He taught us how to know his return, what it will look like. He reveals how he will return. And we discuss he will return the same way he left, on the clouds. And every knee will bow before him and see and witness. So in this final part of this series, part four, I want to look at his promises. Yahweh's promises to those who are called by his name. But before I do, I just want to go over these passages of scripture because they are important in the context of what we've been talking about in this series. Luke, the Gospel of Luke, adds a little bit more to the times than what Matthew does. But it's talking about the same times. So here's this verse in Luke. Luke 17, 26 to 29. And he says, And it, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. 
So what we need to know in both these situations, Noah and Lot, there was birth pangs. It was suddenly, there was tribulation that came out of nowhere. They were not ready. They didn't listen to the message. Even Lot's wife succumbed because she looked back after she was delivered. She went with Lot and she still didn't make it because she looked back. So we see here that when Noah entered the ark, suddenly the door was shut and the rains came and the, and the, the floods came from beneath. As it was in the days of Lot, suddenly it started raining fire and brimstone supernaturally. That's birth pains. It's a suddenly event. This is what Luke is teaching and adding to and revealing to us. It will be a suddenly. They'll be eating. We'll be eating. We'll be drinking. We'll be giving in marriage. We'll be doing our businesses. We'll be doing all these everyday, normal day things. But for us, we'll also be watching and waiting. But the rest of humanity will be living life as normal. They planted, they built, they bought and sold. And then there will be a suddenly. Jude 1.8, this is the ESV version. They said to you, in the last time, there will be scoffers following their ungodly passions. Make of that of what you will in today's society. In my opinion, there are a lot of scoffers that stand against the ways of Yahweh in our world. And they'll be following their own ungodly passions. Well, we're seeing that also today. 2 Peter 3 verses 3 to 4. Knowing this verse, that scoffers will come in the last days and walk according, walking according to their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? This is a scoffing remark. They're mocking, where is it? Where is he? Where is this God of yours? Where is this Messiah? For since the fathers fell asleep and things continue as they, they were from the beginning of creation. And again in 1 Timothy 4, 1, now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter time some will depart from the faith. That's talking about those that are within the body. Some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And again in 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 to 5. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. This is the time of sorrows. This is the time of great tribulation. This is the time of the day of Yahweh. Day of Messiah when he will return. Perilous times will come for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money. Does that fit in today's world? Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Does that fit in today's world? Unthankful, unholy, especially when we understand what the context of what it is to be holy. Unloving, unforgiving, Slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of Yahweh, having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. Another way of saying we live in the world, but we don't be part of the world. Which is exactly what Abraham did. He lived among the sons of Heth, but he was not a part of their world. He wasn't a part of their lifestyle. So again, this is Paul teaching Timothy about these times, 2,000 years ago. Nothing new under the sun. These things are still going on. So we have been given plenty of evidence of what to look for. It has been revealed what the world will be like, even warned about those who will be among us, wolves in sheep clothing, to deceive and cause some to fall away. But, and there is always a but, and buts are sometimes positive and other times they are negative. 
But there are many times, which is what I want to emphasize today, Yahweh promises in his word to be with us, to watch over us and to protect us, those who are called by his name, those who have the blood of Yeshua over their doorpost. 2 Corinthians 1.4 Who says, Who comforts us in all our tribulation, but they will be able to... That, sorry, that we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble with a comfort with which we ourselves have been comforted with by God. Here's this same verse in a different translation. The Young's, literal. The same verse. Who is comforting us in all our tribulation for our being able to comfort those in any tribulation through the comfort with which we are comforted ourselves by God. What a powerful verse this is for those who are called to live in this day and hour. We are to be a comfort to the world in tribulation with the comfort that we're being comforted with. We are to reveal and expose the same comfort and love of God that God's comforting us to those who are in tribulation, to those who are without hope, so we're comforted so we can be a comfort. What a powerful verse that is. The word comfort in this verse is the Greek word parakaleo. Parakaleo. And it means to call to one side. To call for and summon. This is what Yahweh does to us. He's going to cause us to come alongside him. A bit like being gathered under the wings of the hen. As the hen gathers its chickens under the wing, that's comfort. That's drawing alongside. That's calling in. That's what Yahweh will be to us. So then we can be a comfort and call in others to our side. This is the same root word when the Holy Spirit is described as our helper and comforter. It's the same root word in Greek. Parkalis, which explains what the Holy Spirit will be doing. Now, one of the Hebrew words for comfort is nakum. Nakum, and it means to comfort, be comforted, to console oneself, to be sorry, repent, regret, and change attitudes. And here's an example of this Hebrew word for comfort. And it's in Genesis 50, verse 21. And it says, Now therefore, do not be afraid. Same theme going along way back in Genesis. Do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. He drew them in. He drew them alongside. Now what is the context of this? The context of this is Joseph and his brothers after the death of Yaakov, his fathers, because his brothers freaked out and thought, Joseph is going to turn against us now that our father is dead. And then he replies with this, I will provide for you and your little ones. And we know Joseph is a pattern shadow of Mashiach, Messiah. These are his brothers. Judah, Israel, drew them alongside and comforted them. So it will be in the end days with our brothers, Judah and Ephraim. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Powerful uh, example of comfort way, way back. Another Hebrew word that is used for comfort is Nahal. And it means to lead, give rest, lead with care, guide to a watering place or station, cause to rest, bring to a place or station of rest, to guide, refresh, and to lead. Sounds like a shepherd that leads and guides his flock. 
This is the picture of this in the natural, is that leading of a flock to pasture, which is what the Holy Spirit, Yeshua, and Yahweh will do for us. Those who are called by his name, he will comfort, he will lead, he will water, he will provide, he will be a shelter, he will provide pasture. Just like he did to Israel in the Exodus, exactly the same. Speaking of the Exodus, here we have an example of this Hebrew word, Nahal. Exodus 15, verse 13. You in your mercy have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. What's the context of this verse? The context of this verse is the Song of Moses. And they were praising and worshipping and giving thanks to God because of the victory over Egypt, the world, the enemy, because Yahweh went before them and led them and guided them and provided for them and gave them the victory. That's the context of this verse. You have led forth your people whom you have redeemed. The blood, Yeshua, the blood of the Passover land, you have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. Psalm 9 verse 9, Yahweh will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Now if you take your mind back to part 1, we spoke about the Greek word for trouble which is flipsis. That's this word here in the Septuagint. Flipsis, tribulation, trouble. Yeshua said, Blessed are you when you are persecuted for my name's sake. I will be your refuge. Come to me, come alongside me. I will give you comfort. I will gather you under my wings. Psalm 37 verse 39. But the salvation of the righteous is from Yahweh. He is their strength in time of flipsis. Trouble. Tribulation. This is everywhere in our Bibles. He is our salvation for the righteous. He is our strength in these times. Again in Psalm 138 verse 7. Though I walk in the midst of trouble. Tribulation. Flipsis. You will revive me. You will stretch out your hand against the wrath of my... Uh, and your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. That's talking about Yeshua. Yeshua is the right hand. Again, flipsis, tribulation. Though I walk through the midst of flipsis, tribulation, you will revive me. Nahum, verses 1 to 7. Yahweh is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those who trust in him. He is a stronghold in the day of trouble again. The word flips us, tribulation. Proverbs 11.8 The righteous is delivered from trouble and it comes to the wicked instead. This is what the book of Revelation is all about. The four horses and everything else that goes with it. It's to the wicked. It's not to the righteous. Because the righteous are under, the, under his tower, under his wings. It, it, the righteous is delivered from trouble. Flips us. Here we go to look at this verse in another translation. Again, the youngs. The righteous from distress is drawn out. They are drawn out of trouble. And the wicked go in instead. The wicked goes instead. The righteous are drawn out. God always draw, uh, draws out the righteous. The righteous have come out. The wicked are left. He always brings out the righteous. There are many other times in the scriptures where Yahweh promises to be with those who are righteous, who are obedient to his ways. 
especially when it talks about the day of Yahweh, which is the day of Yeshua, our Messiah, when he returns. There are references in the prophets, like Isaiah, Zephaniah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Joel, Amos, and also many in the New Testament, like the Gospels, Thessalonians, and the book of Revelation. If you are not righteous or redeemed by that day, this day will be a very bad day for you because you're not under the refuge. You're not under the wing. You don't have a strong tower. You're taken in instead of taken out. This is why the word teaches there will be a weeping and gnashing of teeth when and men and rulers and kings will be trembling and shaking to their very core when that horse starts to run. When that rider is on his white horse with a sword, I tell you what, there's going to be some kings shaking in their boots. This day is not a bad day for the saints, for those who have his name on them. The book of Revelation talks that they will be marked on their forehead with his name, the righteous. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 11. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Why? Because they were believers. They knew the times and the seasons. They knew the feast. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of Yahweh so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, this is what we spoke about earlier in the last couple of parts in Matthew. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labour pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so this day should not overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day. This is talking about righteousness. If you're of the day, you're righteous. Be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Yeshua HaMashiach. We are not appointed for wrath. Yeshua Mashiach, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort. There's that word again, comfort. Each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. So we see Paul is talking about what we're talking about in Matthew and Luke. He's using the exact same stuff. John 16.33 These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. Shalom. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So if you're in the world, you will go through tribulation. You will be drawn in instead of drawn out. Acts 14.22 Strengthening the, the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. But Yahweh will be with us. We will go through it, but he will be with us. Sounds a little bit like going through the plagues and wilderness on the way to the promised land to me. They went through this experience to reach the promised land. Yahweh doesn't say anywhere that it will be a tiptoe through the tulips. It will be a walking on petals. He says he will be with us. He will provide for us. He will look after us and watch over us. Isaiah 41 verses 8 to 10. But you, Israel, are my servant. Jacob, whom I have chosen, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. You who I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest regions 
and said to you, You are my servant. I have chosen you and have not cast you away. What does Yeshua say to those that enter into the kingdom? Welcome, good and faithful servant. Fear not. Do not be troubled. Fear not. I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your Elohim. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Yeshua Messiah. Like in Matthew 24 that we've gone through over the last couple of weeks, he calls them from the four winds of the earth, saying exactly the same thing here in Isaiah. Nothing about going to the mountains. He's calling them from the four winds of the earth, from across the globe. This is what is being shown here as well. I have taken you from the ends of the earth and called you from its farthest regions. Same thing. We need not to be fearful of the end times of tribulation nor the day of Yahweh. If you are redeemed, washed in the blood of the Lamb, Yeshua our Messiah, and have the word of the testimony, i.e. the Torah, Yahweh's words, there are many promises of peace and shalom for you. It will be a constant fight though. It will be a constant fight against fear, anxiety, stress and worry as we will be bombarded by it from the media, social media platforms and in, from society in general. We will be bombarded by it. It will be, it will be in our face all the time. A little, like, a, bit, a little bit like the ungodly lifestyles of people today, we are bombarded with it. We are intolerant if we don't accept it. We are misogynistic, bigots. This is how we're described if we uphold and hold to the ways of Yahweh. But he says, do not be worried, <laughs> do not fear. I, guess, I get asked this a bit. What do we do to prepare for these times? The $64 million question. What do we do to prepare for these times? Like I've said over and over again, there are so many different opinions and voices out there, many suggestions and much, and I want to emphasise this, much speculation. But I will only offer a couple of things that I know for sure, that I know with everything that's in me. And what are those couple of things? The things that I believe that will only really matter, regardless of how this plays out, these things work in every scenario. Hebrews 10, verses 23 to 25. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who is promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. What day? The day of Yahweh. Exhorting, encouraging, uplifting, exhorting one another. Hold fast the confession of your hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. What did he promise? We've just gone through heaps of verses about what he's promised. What else do I know? For sure, 100% guarantee. Repent. Keep short accounts. Follow Yahweh in his ways without wavering. Keep in fellowship with believers. I am sure and am confident that if you do these, you will hear and be led by the Holy Spirit. As we all will, and we'll all hear the same voice. That's how I know. In regard to the rest of it, what will happen, who's doing what, what country's going to 
do to what to something to another country, what president's doing, what I don't really care. All that matters is that my relationship with God. All that matters is am I in fellowship? All that matters is am I in covenant with Him and following Him and His Word and His ways? Because if you're not doing any of that, the rest doesn't matter. Why? Because the righteous are drawn out, the wicked are drawn in. How is one righteous? You know. Another important point I would like to make, that this is a plural event. It's not individual. It's not independent. It is plural. The words used in these verses are in the plural when it talks about they, you, they're plural. They're not singular. The you is plural. As in the assembly or the congregation of the righteous. When it talks about the righteous, it's not talking about individual. It's talking about the assembly and the congregation of the righteous. This is not something that one goes through alone or independently. It is the kahal, which is the Hebrew word for assembly, the congregation. It is the assembly of Yahweh. They, the group of Yahweh. It is the body of Messiah. It's not the arm of Messiah. It's not the left finger of Messiah. It's not the big toe of Messiah. It is the body of Messiah. The many parts that make up the body. It's not an independent, individual thing. Luke 21.36 Watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all the things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Watch, therefore, and pray always. Following Yahweh, being in covenant, being in Mishpaka, and all the rest of it that you know, that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass. Daniel 12 verse 1 And at that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book. How are you found written in the book? By the blood of the Lamb, forgiveness of sins, living a lifestyle that honours Yahweh. And then it says, you shall be delivered. Another powerful promise. Revelation 12 verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. And I've said this before, some of us are going to die. Who? Well, that's Yahweh's problem. But we will not love our lives even to the death, just like the first century disciples experienced similar fates. But they overcame by the blood and the word. Revelation 7, verses 9 to 17. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, of all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen! Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honour, and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? Verse 14, And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who came out of the great tribulation and washed their robes, and made white 
made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. The great shepherd. And lead them. Comfort. Nahal. To living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Hallelujah. So there is a separation. Do you have the blood on your robe or do you not? Are you going to be drawn in or are you going to be drawn out? It's everywhere. We serve a loving, merciful God who has revealed many times what will be because he loves us. He wants us to know what will be, what will happen. He wants us before that throne with the multitudes. He has shown us over and over again his promises and faithfulness to those who have chosen and received his redemption through Yeshua the Messiah. He is faithful both in protection and in judgment, in pouring out his wrath in the end of days. These things will take place. How do I know that? Isaiah 55 verse 11 says, So shall my word that goes out from my mouth it shall not return to me void, but it will accomplish what I please and it will prosper in the very thing that I sent it to do. It's going to happen. Revelation has gone out from his mouth. Matthew 24 has gone out from his mouth. And all the other accounts and Thessalonians and Luke and Mark, and they've all gone out from his mouth. It will accomplish what's been set forth to do. The four horses will go. The bowls will be poured out. Those trumpets will be blown. The seven seals will be broken. The angels will do what they've been sent forth to do. All of it. So to finish finish all this up, and I'm not going to dress it up. Yes, these things will get extremely difficult. It will be extremely difficult. I don't deny that at all. It will be extremely difficult in the world. But I believe it is the world, meaning those who live a worldly life, meaning those who don't believe in God, in the Bible, or in what Yeshua did in dying on the cross and paying the price for the death penalty of sin. The pattern is the plagues leading up to the Exodus. Israel experienced the first three. Then the rest that followed Israel, God's people, was separated from. All those experiences, they saw them, but those plagues didn't come into their habitations or their dwelling places or their land, which was in Egypt, by the way, in the world. We're in it, but not of it. They experienced the first three and were separated from the rest of the plagues, which, by the way, in that particular verse, is the Hebrew word used in context when Israel was separated from Egypt. It is the same three-letter root word meaning redemption, ransom. Just a coincidence, I guess, that Israel, at the time of their separation of the plagues, it was the word ransom and redemption. I have taught you about tribulations and the great tribulation and gave the concrete meaning of a squeezing and compression that's coming, one that has never been. And I believe we're in the very beginnings of that right now, of the time of sorrows which I shared before. We are at the very, very start of squeezing and compression in societies and we're seeing it. Whether that is from an external or internal source. We are told by Yeshua himself not to be troubled, alarmed, 
or afraid to watch for deceivers and not to go after people who declare he is over there or he is over here. These same people will cause some to go astray. That there will be some who come and they will be offended, betray each other. That lawlessness will abound and cause the hearts of some to grow cold. This is what we've already talked about. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of a spirit of power, love and a sound mind, which is the same language Paul uses about being sober. We are sons of the day. It's the same idea, a sound mind. We are told how we, he will return and what will happen on that day, known as the day of Yahweh. We also discussed that part of Matthew 24 has already come to pass and in Jerusalem in 70 AD. However, there is a time in the future of a great tribulation and God calls his own from the four winds of the earth, also found in Matthew 24. We can have peace and faith in his promises and plans which we've just gone over for the last hour or so, whatever it's been. We can have peace and faith in his promises and plans. We are to continue to watch and occupy until he comes. Now this word occupy is found in Luke, I think it's 13. Anyway, it's in Luke and it talks about the, the, the servants working while the master's out and waiting for him to return. It's a parable about the end times. And it's talking about occupy until he comes. That means do business, work, do your jobs. But keep watching and waiting until he comes. It doesn't mean sell up everything and wait for him in the woods like it's happened in the past. He says occupy until he comes. Watch and wait for him to return. Again, I want to emphasize the words of Yeshua. Do not be troubled. I will say this over and over again. Do not be troubled. We are to be his witnesses on earth. We are to show comfort with the same comfort we've been shown in times of tribulation like we read out in 1 Corinthians earlier. Uh, sorry, 2 Corinthians. We are to be his witnesses on earth showing that by how we live and how we worship our God. We are born for such a time as this. Like I said, as in 2 Corinthians 1 4, he gives us up, he gives us comfort so we can be a comfort to others with the same comfort we have been shown, especially in these days. I have always said and will continue to say that regardless of your view of the end times and how it will play out, the most important issue will be your own relationship with God. It comes back to, do you know him? Do you know him? One needs to understand, know and understand what that means. What does that mean to know God? Especially in the context when Yeshua says, depart from me, I don't know you. It means... This, by walking on his narrow path and living your life on that path, on that way. By worshipping him the way he wants to be worshipped. By meeting him on his appointed times as laid out in Leviticus 23. How does one know the narrow path and how God wants to be worshipped and how he wants us to live? Well, that can only be found in the Torah, which are the teachings and instructions of God found in the front of the book. Isaiah 46.10 says, Declaring the end from the beginning, from the ancient times, things that are not yet done. Saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. You want to know why there's so much speculation and differences of opinion? Because they don't read the front of the book. He says here, he declares the end from the beginning. You want to know what the end is? Read the beginning. He's shown it from the start. 
But of course, most don't read the beginning because the beginning is done away with and finished. Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20. And this is what Yeshua says. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. What's the end of the age? The day of Yahweh, the day of Messiah returning. What are we to do? Go and preach the gospel, not pack up and run to the mountains. Preach the gospel. Be a witness. Be a comforter to those who need comforting. That's what my Bible says. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. What is he commanded us? The Torah. There's no new commandments. In the end, it comes to this. In the end, this is all that matters. Whatever your opinion and view is, are you washed in the blood? Do you have the blood of Messiah over your doorpost? And if that is so, hallelujah. We are to preach the gospel, this message. Do you have the blood? That's the comfort that we have been comforted with. Because as we went, went, went over and over and over again today, if you are righteous, if you have that blood, he's your strong tower, he's your refuge, he provides everything for you. His promises are yes and amen. If you don't have the blood, it doesn't really matter what you think about the end times. This, in my opinion, is all that matters. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you love us so much that you have revealed to us what we need to do. Quite clearly and plainly. Father, we thank you for your word that is so full of promises and exhortation and encouragement for those who are called by your name. Father, may we be found in the end with our robes dipped in the blood of the Lamb. Father, may we be numbered among those multitudes that will be bowed down before your throne. Father, may we be counted worthy to be part of your people. Father, help us to guard our hearts. Father, help us to, 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 to be discerning. Father, help us to be uplifting and encouraging and edifying and exhorting each other to the day of Yeshua. I pray, Yahweh, that you would fill each and every one of us with your spirit, that our hearts will not grow cold. Father, that we would be teachable, flexible, that we would be people that are led by the spirit of Yahweh. For your word says that those that are led by the spirit are the sons of God. Father, protect us, guard us, help us, Father, when we, when we quiver, when we shake, when we tremble, when we get worried and anxiety, anxious, remind us of your promises. Father, and may we always stick within the Mishpaka. That's where I want to be, in the assembly of the righteous. Help us, Father. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you love us so much that you reveal these things to us that we should not be troubled, that we should not be afraid, and that we should put our total faith and trust in your word, for it will do what it says. And we thank you for that today in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Thank you for watching. We pray that this teaching has been a blessing to you. For more information, please go to www.ancientfoundationbiblefellowship.com. Shalom.